great team. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Pearson Airport. It's great to see so many people here, including uh, all of our team members from the uh, Ontario PC Caucus. Uh, I'm so pleased to be here with our team and with our Premier, uh, Doug Ford, and Finance Minister Peter bethan Falvey to share some really exciting and important news. Under the leadership of our Premier, our government is building a stronger Ontario that works for everyone. We have ambitious plans to grow, from building roads, bridges, and highways, to building more than one and a half million homes and expanding subways and public transit. We are creating more opportunities for people in every community across our province. We are also facing the largest labour shortage in a generation, with almost 300,000 jobs going unfilled today. And we must tackle this head-on using every tool at our disposal. That is why we are investing heavily in training to help people prepare for good, in-demand jobs and why we are welcoming more skilled immigrants and recognizing their credentials. Earlier this month, I was pleased to join Federal Minister Sean Fraser to announce a historic doubling in the number of economic immigrants we can select to 18,000 by 2025. This increase means we can grow our economy by filling jobs, to care for those in our community who need it most, and to build new homes, schools, and transit. Today, it's an honour to be joined by Clarence Walters, who leads the maintenance of safety and plumbing systems here at Pearson. Clarence came to Ontario and to Canada in 1987. Over the past 20 years, he's put his skills to use to keep the airport running smoothly for the over 12 million people who rely on it every year. Clarence's story is one of many, of skilled immigrants coming to Ontario in search of a better life, only to be held back by barriers that prevent so many from working in the field they've studied. This isn't how it should be in Canada. We've been focused on removing these barriers they face, including the requirement for Canadian work experience. Newcomers never cease to amaze me with the determination they have to overcome obstacles to build a better life for them and their families here in Ontario. Because no matter where you come from, you can build the Canadian dream for you and your family. Our futures are only limited by our dreams and our willingness to work hard. And as the Premier says, we need all hands on deck to build a stronger Ontario. To share more about his story, I'm really pleased and honoured to welcome Clarence to the podium. Clarence, over to you. Thank you, Minister McNaughton. A warm welcome to yourself, Premier Ford, and Minister Bethlen Farvey. From all of us at the GTA, we are honoured that Toronto Pearson was chosen as the location to make this exciting announcement. Ontario is truly a place of opportunity. I myself arrived in December of 1987 as a foreign trained and experienced commercial diver. And 35 years later, work in a different profession and still call Ontario, Canada home. It has not been all smooth sailing and like many others, endured a lot of ups and downs and faced many challenges. Unlike today, there were no educational transition programs to assist with career changes and the term transferable skills was unheard of. With the help of the Ontario Association of Certified Engineering Technicians and Technologists and a never giving up attitude, I was fortunate to overcome many of those obstacles. Today there's a lot more support available. We are looking forward to hearing about the Ontario government's plan to help new immigrants find meaningful employment sooner in their field. I would like to thank the GTA for providing me with a challenging and rewarding career for the past 20 years. Finally, a big shout out to the GTA maintenance team and especially to my life safety and plumbing technical team for always supporting me and helping me challenge the status quo. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Clarence, for sharing that story and for everything you've done to build a better life here in Ontario for you and your family. It's now my pleasure to welcome uh, our friend and our colleague, uh, Minister Bethan Falvey, the Minister of Finance, to the podium. 
Well, thank you. Uh, thank you, Monty. And what a great story, Clarence. You know, you represent uh, what is the dream for so many, and we're here today to talk more about making that dream uh, reality and quicker. Uh, I'm, it's an honor always to be joined by my colleagues, all my caucus colleagues here today, as well as the uh, Mayor of Mississauga, uh, Monty McNaughton, the Minister of Labour, Immigration, Training and Skills Development. And again, I want to thank Clarence for sharing that incredible story with us. Truly an inspiration, an example of why so many people want to make Ontario their home. Now, last week, I had the honour of delivering our government's 2023 budget, building a strong Ontario. Our responsible and targeted approach to supporting Ontario families, workers and businesses is a plan to attract investments and jobs to build Ontario's economy. It's a plan to build the roads, the hospitals, the schools and the transit that we need faster. It's a plan to train the workers we need for the jobs of today and for tomorrow. And it's a plan that has a bright future for the people of Ontario. A future that includes more skilled immigrants. To build our historic infrastructure plan, we need more skilled workers. I'll repeat that. We need more skilled workers. And supporting and welcoming skilled newcomers, like my parents, to Ontario is a key part of our plan to address the labour shortage. As the child of Hungarian immigrants, refugees in fact, I know firsthand about the importance of having an economy of opportunity and strong growing communities that new families can call home. Our plan is building a strong Ontario, a province that is ready to welcome new immigrants. And we're here at Pearson. What better symbol of immigration and the gateway to Canada than Pearson Airport? A province where newcomers can hit the ground running and plan their routes so they can achieve the Ontario dream. Our government has the right plan, not just for today, but for future generations. And while responsibly balancing the, balancing the budget three years ahead of schedule, which is so critical to future generations, not just today, so that our province remains resilient and stable for generations to come. You know, folks, we have the right Premier, we have the right team, and we are building an Ontario that we can all be proud of. And with that, it's my distinct honour to introduce the Premier of Ontario, Doug Ford. Well, good morning, everyone, and uh, I have to tell Peter, thank you, but we have the right finance minister as well. What a, what a great team. And uh, Clarence, I have to tell you what an amazing story. And, and folks, they were, they were swapping stories uh, before we came out, and like Deepak and on came here in the year 2000. Our MPP from Mississauga Malton was telling the story how he landed here, and it was pretty cold the, the day he landed but Natalia Kusindova and Nina Tangri and what, what an incredible team and see how far everyone has come since 2000 and Clarence your story is amazing too. I've always said Clarence when I was in the private sector nothing's more important to any company than their maintenance department. Without the maintenance department the thing everything shuts down so, so thank you. And I want to—I want to thank the the team from the GTAA, uh, the Commander in Chief Deborah. I know you were saying at any given time you could use another thousand people. We have endless jobs, and it's great to be back here in Mississauga alongside Minister Betham Falvey, McNaughton, Mulroney, and our local champions, Minister Tangri and Minister Rashid and MPP Cazetto, Anon, Kusindova, and Sabawe, and our great mayor, and she's a great mayor, Mayor Bonnie Crombie. So thanks for being here, Mayor. And she was just telling me about the beautiful blue dress, right? <laughs> she wore that blue just for me, so thank you, Mayor. Mayor, it's good to be uh, here again in the great city of Mississauga, and, and thank you to everyone again at the Toronto Pearson Airport for hosting us today. As Peter mentioned, last week we introduced our 2023 budget, Building a Strong Ontario. Our budget, it's a responsible, a targeted plan to help people and businesses today while laying a strong foundation for generations to come. This plan builds on our work to date to create the conditions for businesses to grow and workers to succeed. I, was, I always say, government doesn't create jobs, we create the environment and the conditions for companies to come here to thrive, prosper and grow. And when companies thrive, prosper and grow, so do the people that work at those companies. The numbers speak for themselves. The previous government chased 300,000 jobs out of this province. 
Since then, we've created an environment, along with other businesses right across this province, 600,000 more people are working today than in 2018, and 300,000 jobs available in every sector. I know Monty and I kind of have this debate, 300 to 380,000, but we have a ton of jobs available in every sector. We continue to attract billions of dollars in new investments, including over $17 billion over the past two years in the auto sector alone. And just think of all those jobs, there's seven to one spin-off jobs. But as we navigate global uncertainty, we can't take this progress for granted, and we won't. We're continuing to invest in and support our growing communities and economy. But my friends, as we continue to attract global investments, as we build Ontario, we're facing a historic labour shortage, with hundreds of thousands of jobs going unfilled each and every day. And as you've heard me say time and time again, we're going to need tens of thousands of new skilled construction workers to help build the factories, highways, homes, transit, schools, and hospitals our growing economy needs. We need more skilled workers, and we need them now. That's why we're investing $25 million over three years to make it easier and faster for skilled newcomers to come to Ontario. So folks, if you know any skilled workers, bring them here to Ontario and we'll make sure we expedite it through to help fill the jobs and the skilled trades in healthcare. This new investment will ensure Ontario is ready to welcome new skilled workers. As part of our doubling of the number of economic immigrants the province can select, to a historic high of 18,000 by 2025. I know I've been going uh, at, at the PM in a good way about saying we need more people, increase the volume, let us take the load off your back. So I want to thank them for helping us out, but we need a little more than 18,000 as well. And it will speed up processing times to ensure those coming to Ontario can start working in their professions quickly. Ontario has the jobs, the world has the talent. This investment in the increase in skilled workers from around the world is on top of the historic investments we're making to train the workforce of tomorrow. As part of our $1.5 billion skilled trade strategy, including a new $225 million investment to upgrade and build new training centers. My friends, whether it's upskilling workers through our skills development programs, attracting more young people into the skilled trades, or breaking down barriers to get more skilled newcomers into the province, we're leaving no stone unturned. It's all hands on deck. We have the right plan to build Ontario, and we're developing the right workforce to get it done. Now, later today, sorry for the long speech today, folks, but later today, this is going to be really important. My really good friend, Christia Freeland, will release the federal government's latest budget. This is an important time in the history of our country and province. We have a real opportunity to build an economy full of opportunity for workers and businesses, not only for today, but for generations to come. Realizing that opportunity, it requires that all levels of government work together. Just look at what we can accomplish when we all work together. When we have the municipalities working together in the province and the feds, we are unstoppable. Billions in game-changing investments that are putting Ontario and Canada back on the map as an automotive powerhouse, including the recent announcement that Volkswagen has chosen St. Thomas, Ontario as a new home of its first ever offshore battery plant, building on our success in attracting the Stellantis LG battery plant to Windsor. And there's still more news coming, folks. Or the recent healthcare funding deal that's helping provinces invest in the kind of convenient care that people need close to home. Not to mention the child care agreement and how we rolled out tens of millions of vaccines or negotiated the Safe Restart Agreement. Canada is a country that can do great things, that can do anything when we work together. So I'm calling on my friend, Christia, to work together to do great things with critical minerals in the ring of fire. I know she knows we can't pretend to rely on the bad actors like Russia. We need to build up stable homegrown supply chains that unlock the economic potential of the critical minerals and to connect 
them to our growing electric vehicle and battery ecosystem. It's a win, win, win. Workers win, businesses win, Ontarians win. As our communities grow, I'm also calling on my friend Christia to join us in doing everything possible to build more homes so families aren't locked out of the dream of home ownership. In order to tackle the housing affordability crisis, governments at all levels need to work together to get more shovels in the ground. So like Minister Beth Falvey did last week, I'm calling on the federal government to defer the harmonized sales tax on all new large scale proposed built rental housing projects. This will spur construction of more rental housing. It will help create jobs, drive economic development and support growth. It's another win, win, win. We've got big challenges ahead, but we've got even bigger opportunities and there's nothing we can't do when we work together. I want to thank you for joining us today. I want to thank the GTAA again for hosting us and may God bless the people of Ontario. Thank you. We'll now go to the floor for questions. If reporters could please line up at the microphone behind me. If you could please identify yourselves by name and outlet and it will be one question and one follow up. First question. Good morning, uh, Premier. This is Nitin Chopra from Prime Asia TV. How are you, my uh, friend? Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Good. Um, Premier, uh, we have a very big force of international students here in Canada, and Ontario is the largest province. Yes. And recently, Education Minister, he announced that from next year, there will be a mandatory technical education course. So question is, for the Ontario PNP, why don't Ontario put a mandatory uh, technical education course for the international students because right now what courses they are choosing is business administration or business management which has no value or minimum value so why can't ontario put a condition anyone want a pr in ontario through ontario pnp they should have a mandatory technical education uh, course so that ontario can use that workforce for their skills minister but what I always tell all the international students, I don't want them to go back home. When you come here, stay, lay down your roots, and uh, call Canada your, your home. But maybe, uh, Minister McNaughton, you want to fill in on that one? Look, we're, um, we're very excited about this new agreement with uh, the federal government. I mean, a historic agreement. When you think only 10 years ago, Ontario could uh, only select 1,000 uh, immigrants, but under the New Deal, we're going to select uh, over 18,000 by 2025. Uh, our goal now is to create um, uh, just more flexibility in the program. With higher numbers, we'll be able to be more flexible. Um, our priority, uh, to be clear, is going to be healthcare workers and skilled trades workers um, to ensure that we're filling labor shortages uh, across the province. And as the Premier said, um, it, it's all hands on deck to build back a, a stronger province, and we do want to keep those international students here. Uh, Follow-up is, uh, uh, Premier, uh, uh, security and safety is a major concern in all over Canada and Ontario also. And all the new immigrants, they also need security safety. Crime rate is very high. Yeah. Even TTC got shaken with the series of incidents. Carjackings are unstoppable. Insurance companies are making huge profit by these carjackings because they are refunding all $60,000 cars to the consumers. Criminals are out on streets and uh, bail reform is required of the R. What your comment on all this security and safety situation? Well, th again, thank you for that great question. I think that's going to be the, the number one item when it comes to the mayoral election here in Toronto. When Rob and I were down at, at City Hall from 2010, 2014, I'll say even 2012, there's 540, I think 540 or 550 less police officers in Toronto than there were back then. We need safe subways, we need safe communities, but we also need bail reform. 13 premiers signed a, a letter over to the federal government. I understand they're going to be moving on it, but we can't have the bad guys shooting up the streets and all of a sudden going in, in front of the courts and getting let out literally the next day. It's unacceptable. Uh, the criminal code falls under the federal government. We need to toughen up crime, I mean, toughen up the sentences. When you commit a crime with a gun, you should be going away for a long time. We don't want people running around our communities, shooting up the streets, not to mention 
the, the police officers that got ambushed and got assassinated from people that should have been in jail and they were out on bail. Totally unacceptable. And uh, again, we're all for uh, hiring more police officers. We put in tens of millions of dollars supporting our police. We'll always support our police. And uh, they have a very, very tough job. But enough's enough. When we arrest these, uh, these criminals, they need to go to jail and they need to go to jail for a long time. Premier, good morning. It's Richard Southern from City okay. News. Uh, it looks like uh, Christopher Freeland is set to announce today uh, help for low-income individuals to afford a, a surging grocery prices. Uh, why are you leaving it solely up to the federal government to help Ontarians struggling to put food on the table? Why wasn't there any new measure like that in your budget, sir? Well, we did it before the federal government, and thanks for that question, Richard. When we knocked off the uh, tolls, one area, we knocked off the license registration tax. We we're almost, by the end of the year, we'll be close to $10 a day uh, daycare. We've cut that cost in, in half. We're making it more affordable. We aren't raising taxes. And it goes back to the federal government, and I get along very well, and I think the world of Christia. This carbon tax is killing people. They're going to jack up the carbon tax on gases, on groceries, on everything, by three cents. That's a total of 14 cents at the gas pumps for a tax. That's unacceptable. It's driving up the cost. Energy costs are one of the areas that causes inflation. We need to put a, a stop on this carbon tax, at least put a pause on this carbon tax. People cannot afford it, but we're always going to continue making sure it's more affordable for, for people to live right here in uh, Ontario. Premier, I'll follow up on another issue. Uh, taxpayers want to know what's going on with the Eglinton Crosstown. I'm hoping the Transportation Minister can weigh in. You know, ne never mind blaming the Liberals. Can you just tell us straight up, once and for all, why has the Eglinton Crosstown been delayed? Yeah, well, good, good question, Richard. Again, I'm not going to blame the, the, the Liberals. We inherited a, a nightmare project. We're doing the best we can. We're going to have it up and going in a very short uh, period of time, and we're going to continue working. We just want to make sure uh, the contractors that uh, did the work, it's 100%, and uh, we're going to get it moving as quickly as possible. But the good news is, folks, the good news is the Eglinton West is four weeks ahead of time on budget. We're building the Ontario line. We're building the Scarborough extension. We're building the Young extension. We're putting together the largest infrastructure transit project in North America right now because previ previous governments have ignored it for years. We've increased the infrastructure budget from 180 to 190 billion dollars it's unheard of we're building hospitals we're building schools we're building roads and bridges and uh, we're building the largest transit project ever in the history of uh, ontario premier good morning steve ryan from cp24 good morning i, I want to ask you about the violence on the uh, ttc what is your government's plan to address that issue are you working with the city of uh, toronto this problem seems to be far larger than a policing issue now or more surveillance cameras on the platforms of the subways. What, what, what is your thoughts on that? Yeah, and folks, uh, Steve, you're a champion. You understand it better than probably any reporter uh, in this room. You've been there, you've worked it. And uh, I just think, Steve, it's, it, you got to put the manpower in there too. Yes, we're dealing with mental health. We're putting money into that. But we need to start making sure that the, the frontline police officers have the tools they need, but also to make sure that we make up for the 540 or 550 police officers, we fell short. And that was my concern about saying we're putting 80 uh, paid duty callbacks because not everyone can fulfill the paid duties. We need full-time police officers in the busiest transit system in, in uh, Canada. We need to give them the resources and give them the, the help but enough's enough with this, this crime. Uh, I've never seen anything like it. That should be the number one issue for any mayoral candidate. And the mayoral candidates that say they want to cut funding for the police, they want to defund the police, don't vote for them. Simple as that. Support the, 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 the candidates that are going to fund the police. You're going to get more police officers uh, in our subways, in our streets, because, again, I've never seen it this bad ever, absolutely ever. And... We need to make sure when we sentence these uh, criminals, uh, they need to go away for a long time without bail. And my, my follow-up, uh, respectively, sir, the problems that are going on with the TTC right now, that appears to be more than just a policing issue. What about addressing the root cause with regards to the social aspects? Is your government 
aware of that on top of that? Or what, what are you doing to address the root causes uh, beyond policing? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I didn't catch the last part. Was it the mental health, you said? Just social, the social issues uh, all around when it comes to those type of crimes being committed by people in crisis. It's more than just arresting them or putting more surveillance cameras to, because surveillance cameras help the police identify, but the, the deed is already yeah. done. So what, well, what, what, good, what are you doing to address well, that? Well, good, good, good point, Steve. We're, again, I just compare us to previous governments. Uh, we have a minister of mental health and addictions, we're putting tens of millions, actually probably hundreds of millions of dollars into supporting communities, making sure that uh, people are taken care of. And if they need any help, be it mental health or addictions, they're gonna have the help. We're gonna make sure that people have good paying jobs to make them feel better, that they're, you know, they have a purpose. But we're, we're throwing everything we can at this. But again, it's kind of a, a, a three-prong approach. Number one, we gotta catch these guys. Number two, we gotta sentence them. And the people that need help, they need to go get help. We can't just release them. Good morning, Premier. Uh, Liam Casey with the Canadian Press. Um, yeah. Doctors across the province, including the OMA, have said the uninsured health care program that you put in place. Guys, I, I apologize. Sorry. I can't hear with all the noise. Can you speak up or? Sure. Yeah. Sorry. Doctors across the province, uh, including the OMA, have said the uninsured health care program that you put in place in 2020 has been a huge success. Uh, they call it a progressive policy and it solved a, a decades long problem. There's at a loss for your decision to cut that program, which is uh, ending on uh, March 31st. They've asked you and Minister Jones for a six month extension to figure out a solution. Would you, would you consider either reversing uh, the decision to end funding for the uninsured healthcare program or extend it by six months to figure out a solution? Well, first of all, I, I just have to give a shout out to the folks at OMA. We have a phenomenal relationship and uh, folks that don't know what the OMA is, Ontario Medical Association, representing the great doctors right across this, this province. But let's, let's make no mistake about it. Anyone, any, uh, anyone from around the world, if they're coming here or any resident of Ontario, if you're ill, you're getting taken care of no matter what. You know, there's misnomers out there. If you, you get hurt and you go to the hospital and you, aren't a, you don't have your OHIP card, you aren't going to get taken care of. That's just not accurate, it's not true. We're gonna make sure we take care of everyone. And we're in good conversations with the OMA right now. Can you talk a bit more about these these conversations? Are you, well, like, okay. is, is, is you negotiating or something to maybe save this program? We're just or? sitting down and, and working with them to make sure that everyone has proper health care making sure that we can get rid of the backlog surgeries and we have a great plan with the community uh, surgical, uh, community uh, care clinics and speeding things up, making sure that we, we listen to the frontline uh, docs, which we are through OMA, listening to the CEOs of the hospitals and, and the nurses. I can tell you one thing, folks, uh, the healthcare industry is very, very appreciative of the great, great budget that Minister Beth and Falvey uh, delivered. Uh, but again, as I've always said, we're pouring billions and billions of dollars into healthcare, and we're all coming up with different uh, ways of delivering it more efficiently, uh, great quality and accountability. Hi there, Alan Hale from Queen's Park today. Hi, Alan. All right, so over the past two weeks, healthcare CEOs have told the Social Policy Committee that many of the concerns about the Your, Ca Your Health Ca Act uh, that critics have warned about, such as draining staff from hospitals and inequality of access, are valid and need to be mitigated. Quote, we are aware of the concerns that the bill may widen the health care access gap, and we share that concern, said John Yip of SC Health. Ontario will need to mitigate a significant migration of medical workers and clicks, said uh, Scarborough Health Network CEO David Graham. You have said in the past that you listen to CEOs mm -hmm. uh, and... Um, so will you listen to them now and make amendments to Bill 60? Well, you just named two. I, I could name 20 that all agree with it, no matter if it's a Sunnybrook or if it's UHN or Humber River or Trillium and so on and so forth. When they're backlogged on 203,000, 203,000 operations, you know, your, your, your mother, your father, your grandmother, your grandfather, walking around waiting 12 months for a knee replacement, a hip replacement, or get cataracts done, you ask them, would they rather have the exact same doctors, same regulations, in a quality care area that they can speed it up and get these operations done in two months, opposed to 18 months or a year? 
uh, we're, the, our whole goal is to reduce the backlog surgeries. And uh, we're working hand in hand with uh, the hospitals. And uh, I'm sorry, but I'm gonna disagree. Our goal is to knock down the surgeries. And that's exactly what we're gonna do. If we keep the system the same, you're gonna be waiting 12 months. You're gonna be waiting 18 months in pain. We wanna make sure it happens in two to three months. And folks, you're paying with your OHIP card. You aren't paying with your credit card. So we aren't draining it. We're, we're, we're actually supporting uh, it. And saying that, we've hired 8,000 more doctors, 60,000 new nurses, 30,000 are in the queue in universities and colleges ready to come on board. Uh, so we're, we're hiring like this province has never seen before. Well, it's, uh, these are people who support this bill, and there are many more than just two from the past two weeks who talked to yeah. the committee. Uh, like, the, you're being told for months that there are issues with this bill and that they need to be corrected before it becomes law. Why won't you do that? Well, very simple. Again, we talked to some of the, the largest hospitals in the country, be it the Trilliums, be it UHN, be it Sunny, Sunnybrook, I got an idea, call Andy Smith at Sunnybrook, one of the greatest hospitals we have in the entire country. See what he believes in. Or Kevin Smith at UHN, or Carly over at Trillium, or Barb, or, or Barb over at, okay, I'm just saying Barb. So we consolidate, I speak to CEOs every single day. And uh, you know, when there's a, there's a hundred and whatever, 140 of them, they may not always agree, but uh, we, we listen to the, the vast majority, a very vast, vast majority, agree with what we're doing. Clara Pasika, CBC. So you've, uh, uh, our radio was, our radio host was speaking to the mother um, of the 16-year-old killed in the robin, random stabbing on the TTC, Andrea Magalis, and she says we need more investment in physical and mental health. We need more support for housing. We need more support for social services. She says that all she wants is for her son's death to not have been in vain, and if she can save one person's life by going on this quest to push for this. What do you say yeah. to her directly? I say I'm so, so sorry for her loss. It's heartbreaking, and I will be calling uh, the mother and father, and our prayers and thoughts go out to her. Um, I don't disagree with her comments. Uh, we're putting $3.8 billion into mental health, unprecedented amounts of money and my heart breaks uh, for them that, that's their their child i will be making a, a call to their family this afternoon they're one of my residents in etobicoke north and we'll do everything we possibly can to make sure this tragedy senseless murder never happens again Hey, good morning, Premier Colin DeMello from World <coughs> News. Um, we've been trying to determine the cost of the Ontario line, but the Ministry yep. of Transportation keeps redacting documents related to the cost. The Canadian Taxpayers Federation is calling for transparency as well. What is the current cost to construct the Ontario line? Yeah, thanks for that question, uh, Colin. So we, we put this out and we're transparent every, every three months. And before I pass it over to the Minister of uh, Finance or, or the Minister of Transportation, We've seen costs escalate, and we, we aren't hiding anything. We've seen costs escalate throughout the pandemic. We see it on all our projects. That's why we went from 180 billion up to 190 billion, but we're, we're staying on top of them constantly. We will be transparent, as I mentioned before. And you know, there's a little miscommunication, and I'm not blaming anyone, but there, there's a cost of actually building, and then there's a separate cost for the operating side but I'll, I'll pass it over to uh, whatever minister wants to start, uh, Minister yeah. of Finance. Yeah, and, and I'll pass it on to uh, Minister Maloney. There you are, nice red. Um, thanks for the question, Colin. You know, uh, you know, we're out here every 90 days. We're out here in a lot of press conferences facing you folks. Uh, this government has been extremely transparent. Of course, uh, some of those costs, as we're building Ontario and the unprecedented infrastructure building that we're doing, and why are we doing so much? We're getting so many people coming to Ontario, but we also have to do some catch up because the last couple of decades, there weren't that many subways built. There weren't that many hospitals built. Uh, you know, the fact that we're talking about a subway, I think is a great, great uh, story. Um, I would say this, there are times when there's commercially sensitive information as well that we've got to be very cautious about. Uh, we're not just building the Ontario line, as you know, we're building a lot of other things. So we're very mindful of that, but as we can, uh, put that information out. We absolutely do, and I'll pass it next to uh, Minister Mulroney. 
Yes, and, and thank you for the question. Um, as uh, contracts are awarded, we publish the value of those contracts online uh, for taxpayers to see. Uh, they're the result of a competitive procurement process, which is good for Ontario taxpayers. We want as many bidders to come out and participate so that we can deliver value for taxpayers. And so we do that, and then as soon as the contract is awarded, we're able to publish the actual figure. And the contract for the Ontario lines, to do, in order to deliver the best value, has been broken up into different segments. Um, and as those different bids are out and contracts awarded, they will be published in a transparent and open way. This will be the last question. Yep. Hey, Premier, Laura Stone, Wogan hey, Mayo. Hey, How are you? Um, you've previously said you're not weighing into the mayoral race, and you've been pretty explicit today of telling the public who not to vote for. So are you now, is that now out the window? You're going to be involved? And then on that note as well, you mentioned the city needing 500, 550 police officers. Is the province willing to invest or give the city any money to to hire more officers? Well, th thanks for that question, Laura. I'm not saying any names. I don't even know what number we're up to. What are we into? 40 some odd people running? Everyone and their cousin, their brother, their uncle and their aunt are running to be mayor of Toronto. But there's only maybe one or two people that I think could uh, actually, actually run the city. And we're putting millions of dollars into policing across the, the province. All I'm saying is if you don't support our police and we're seeing stabbings in the subway, uh, you know, car thefts coming out of our, our gazoo, and uh, just enough's enough. we we got to put more money into policing, and there was a couple candidates uh, that are running, they're sitting councillors, that voted to defund the police. The people that voted for defund the police don't vote for them, simple as that. Um, we, we, can't, we can't have anarchy in our cities, people being scared to get on our subway, go walk down the street, uh, we're known as one of the safest large cities in North America, so I believe in supporting a candidate that understands policing, that understands safe communities, understands safe subways. Uh, that's that's the person I, I believe the city should uh, elect as as the new mayor of Toronto. Thank you so much, everyone. Well, God bless them. If there's more than one or two candidates support our police, then vote for them. I'll, that's up to the that's up to the the police. I mean, up to the constituents. Thank you.